words to us, that each one of us would hear what you have to say to us today. Amen. Amen. I'm on. Can you hear me okay? Great. So, um, let me say welcome to those of you who are new, or to everybody and those online as well, my own welcome to you. Um, as we've already heard, we're doing this um, series on Nehemiah, and we've reached chapter 4, as we just heard read. If you were here last week, um, you will know that in chapter 3, um, we read about people working together to build those walls. And there was a whole, we didn't read the whole list, we only read the first five verses, because there were so many names, and so many people were working together, maybe outside their little house, to build the wall. And they were shoulder to shoulder building the wall. And um, for us, it's a picture um, of how we can all work together to restore the church, and by that I mean the people, not the building, and build the kingdom of God. And sometimes those words, kingdom of God, church, are used pretty interchangeably. They're not the same. The kingdom of God is where God rules. The, the church is hopefully part of the kingdom of God where God rules, but it's also the people of God and the people of God uh, who have been born again, who love Jesus, who have received forgiveness and have become his body. And they want to work to see the kingdom of God extending through all the earth. Um, if we do this, if we do extend the kingdom of God, we're going to find waves of attack from an enemy because that's the way he will respond. And Satan is real and alive on planet Earth. I don't know whether you knew that. Um, probably you don't need too much convincing if you re listen to the news, see what's going on in the world, the evil, the bad things that have always happened and carry on happening. There's something wrong with the world. Um, Carson alluded to some of the things that were wrong in his prayer. But one of them is that sa we have an enemy, Satan, who's around, who is wanting to cause things to go wrong. <clears throat> um, C.S. Lewis brilliantly portrays um, the reality of the spiritual underworld, if I can call it that, in his wonderful little book, The Screwtape Letters, which many of you will probably have read. Um, it's the letters of a senior demon to a junior demon with advice on how to trip his patient up. And uh, at the beginning of the book, C.S. Lewis says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the demons, devils, he calls them. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. In other words, if you don't believe in the devil, he's very happy. Materialist, that's fine. He can get on. You don't know what he's doing. If you're, uh, you go the other extreme and you believe and you want to get involved in all that he's doing, a magician, then uh, he's equally as pleased because then you're getting into things that we shouldn't get involved with. And so <clears throat> we need to not be overly interested in the dark powers, but we need to be aware that they're there. As we read Nehemiah through the lens of the New Testament, through Jesus, uh, we can learn about the tactics that this enemy has uh, and will use against us. And so I want to look today at four waves of attack that the people building the wall experienced um, when they were doing their job. And it teaches us spiritual lessons for our walk. And the first wave was in those first verses. Um, the enemy's response to progress. Verse 1 said, When Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and greatly incensed. You know, this, we can apply these to our personal lives as well as our church life. But when, when we start to grow individually as a Christian, or when the church starts to grow, um, we can expect the enemy to be angry. In verse 1 in the message, it actually says, Sambal had exploded with anger. He was so cross, he was so furious that that wall was beginning to go up. Uh, and, and he was just so angry. 
And why is there anger? That made me think of Psalm 2. There's a, a line, that, why do the nations rage, the writer says. It's, it's because the, the sphere of influence is being um, infringed on. So Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He is the ruler of this planet, unseen, but nevertheless, he's, that's what the Bible calls him. And we come and to take ground from him. And when that ground is taken, he is angry. And so we see in this a picture of as the walls are built with Nehemiah, we see also, uh, and there's anger from the enemies, we see a picture of as we build the kingdom of God, we see the same sort of anger coming from the enemy. Verse 2 says, Sambalat ridiculed the Jews and said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from these heaps of rubble, rubble burned as they are? And then Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what they are building, even a fox climbing on it, would break down the wall of stones. In other words, it's so flimsy that you know, even a fox just jumping on the stones, the wall will fall, uh, fall over. So the enemy's tactics at this point are to belittle um, the building of the wall and the people doing it. He makes them, tries to make them feel stupid and make them feel irrelevant. And often, you know, the enemy takes some truth and mixes it with lies. That's why he's very clever. So there is some truth. The wall was broken down. The stones were a mess. The whole place was in such a mess. There's truth in that. But what he wants to tell us, I wanted to tell them, is, well, you might as well give up now. There's no point. It's, it's hopeless. There's no point. It's impossible. And so he mocks and belittles and ridicules. And Nehemiah prays in verse 5, and he says, in his prayer, that the, the builders are demoralized by all this mockery and by all this scorn. They're discouraged. If you listen to the enemy, you will believe there's no point in going on. Jesus said that the devil is a liar and the father of lies. John 8, 44. He said the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy Maybe you have, in your Christian life, you feel a bit like those broken walls, that things are, are so broken down, you're not quite sure how you're going to get it started again. It's in such a bad state. Um, and, you know, the enemy would want to taunt you and say, well, there's no point. You, you failed so many times, there's no point in trying again. You're going to fail again. And we need to not listen to him. We may have failed. We can say, Lord, I have failed. I'm so sorry. I want to come again. I want to try again. We have to pick ourselves up and say, Lord, I want to go again with you. I want to live with you. I want to follow you. God can rebuild and he can build it stronger than last time, whether that's the walls or whether that's your life in following Jesus. Thank you. What did Jesus um, face as he went to the cross, he faced mockery and scorn and ridicule. You know, as they pushed the crown of thorns on him, hail the king of the Jews, making fun of him. As he hung on the cross, you who saved many, why don't you save yourself? Why don't you come down from the cross? Why don't you save us, the thief said. Why don't you save yourself and us? They made fun of him. He knew, knows what it's like to suffer that type of indignity and that response from people. Jesus also said, if they call the head of the house Beelzebul, in other words, the devil, they're going to do the same with the people, with the members of the household. But he also said in that same passage in Matthew chapter 10, do not fear, and he said that three times, after that. So although we're going to face the same mockery, scorn, ridicule as Jesus, he also says, do not fear. He says, don't fear because he's with us. He's close to us. His spirit is in us. His spirit is leading us. And we can rely on him. Peter, in 1 Peter 4, verse 12, he says, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal. There's going to be real trials. 
you're going to have to face these things. So I'm sorry if you came thinking being a Christian, becoming a Christian was going to turn everything into an easy life. Um, sorry, you were misled on that. It's probably the exact reverse. It's going to become more complicated because there's going to be a battle. There's going to be a fiery ordeal. But we can conquer. We can overcome the lies of the enemy. And we can see God doing great things. How did Nehemiah deal with these things? Well, uh, he did two things. He prayed and he worked. Verse 4 says, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them as plunder. And so he goes on and he calls down, you know, basically, um, not fire and brimstone, but he calls down that the Lord would uh, smite them. And um, sometimes that's a bit like some of those psalms that we read. And we think, is this, this is interesting language. We thought we were meant to just not do that sort of thing. Well, actually, it's the Old Testament, remember. Jesus hasn't been revealed. At least... You can say they're not taking it into their own hands and hurting these people, but they are saying, Lord, see what's going on. Have mercy on us and be just in the situation. We know from Jesus that our response is to be different. It's to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. And so we want to do that. We want to pray for those who persecute us. But we want to pray. We want to pray as Nehemiah did. But Nehemiah didn't stop with praying because praying on its own is not enough. He worked. And it says that the, uh, the wall was built to half its height for the people worked with all their heart. And it's two things. It's prayer and work. That's the answer to the, the attack of the enemy. We need to do both. Prayer does not replace action. And uh, I was going to put this on the screen, but it's not going to be there. John Wesley's famous quote is about action. He said this, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. In other words, do good to people. That's what's going to bring the kingdom as we do good, as we as we pray, but we also do stuff. River Life's vision, as you know, is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the strength bit means that we will do stuff. We won't just pray. We won't just worship. We won't just read the word. We'll do stuff. That's what we have to do. Like Nehemiah, we want to pray, but we also want to do. Who knows what we can achieve as we pray and as we act it's the first wave quite a mild one just a bit of pulling you know being rude to them really wave number two is in the next verses seven to nine <clears throat> and it's more anger and increased opposition the wall has now been built to half its height um, and verse seven the opposition and the anger is growing now it's not just Sanballat it's not Tobiah and the Arab who have been mentioned previously. Now we have the Ammonites and the men of Ashdod. The, men, the Ammonites were on the uh, east side and the men of Ashdod would have been on the, on the west side. In other words, they're even more surrounded by the enemy. That's part of the increased assault of the enemy. And sometimes, I don't know whether you've ever experienced this, but sometimes I've tried something new for the Lord and it's almost as though I've caught the enemy unawares and everything goes really well when I try and do something for the Lord. Then I try and do it again and it's so this time he's aware of what I'm going to try and do. And this time he stands up against me and it's more difficult. And, you know, this maybe they weren't expecting them to start building the wall. Now they're ready for them and they're coming in greater numbers to oppose them. You can see it in Paul's missionary journeys. In, if you are looking at Acts 13, you don't need to do that now, but if you look in Acts 13, when Paul and Barnabas go off on their missionary journeys, it's as though wherever they go, you know, people turn to Christ and become Christians, and there's churches established. But it doesn't take too long before the enemy starts to hit back, and um, they find that they're stirring up people who are interested. They're treading on the territory of other people interested, the Jews. They're taking perhaps people away from the synagogue, the 
the, the people who make the idols and the temples, the, the economic interests, they're offending them. And soon they find quite the different uh, opposition. It's much stirred up from how it had been when they started. And, you know, in our day, um, as people respond to us being Christians, I think very often in the West, uh, in recent years, it's indifference. Ah, okay, you do it. I'm not interested. I'm not, it doesn't affect me at all. But actually, I think that indifference is giving way to something else. It's giving way to anger. Because as we... Um, <clears throat> carry on living a biblical life, we're going to find that our faith clashes more and more with the way that society has gone because it's gone further away from the gospel that has shaped our society. And so there's going to be anger as people respond to that. Um, verse 8 says, They all plotted together, all these people who have come with Sanballat, they, they plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. The New Living Translation says to throw us into confusion. Uh, the New American Standard says to cause a disturbance. And lots of other of the translations say to hinder what we were doing. A hindrance is one of the things that the enemy loves to do. He loves to hinder the work of God. And um, <clears throat> we read in 1 Thessalonians that Paul wanted to go and see the Thessalonians. Tim will know this. He's been studying Thessalonians this week at the School of Biblical Studies, so he can back me up on this. 1 Thessalonians 2, um, Paul wanted to go and see the Thessalonians, but he says I, uh, that because Satan hindered him, he uses those words, because Satan hindered him, he couldn't go. And Satan hinders us sometimes. Sometimes we have to ask the Lord when things happen to us, Lord, is what's happening to me just you know, part of life? Okay, I got up on the wrong side of bed, had a headache, it's not a very good day today, whatever. Or is actually, when things keep going wrong, is there something more? Is the enemy actually around? We had a wonderful test for this. We had a very old car, um, which we called the Red Devil, because it was a very evil car for various reasons. I won't go into them all. But um, things would be going wrong, and we'd think, what is, what's happening? And then suddenly the car would break down. Think, oh, that's what's gone wrong. It's the enemy. Because whenever the enemy was around, the car would break down. So that, it was really quite helpful of the enemy to do that for us. And so, you know, sometimes we need to be aware that we're being hindered. And we need to pray when that happens. Um, another of the words used is confusion here. The, the enemy loves to confuse us and to make us not sure about things. We went on a, we took an outreach uh, in a very religious city on one occasion, and uh, we found that people were very confused about their priorities and about their beliefs. Even though it was this very super Christian city, they were still very confused. And you know, one of the th ways the enemy attacks is to cause confusion, uh, whether it's confusion of priorities, confusion of beliefs. And we need to be very clear and very uh, clear about the priorities of the kingdom of God and clear about the truth of the gospel so people don't get confused. And what is the response of Nehemiah to these, this latest set of attacks? Verse 9, he says, but we prayed to our God. More prayer. If you read Ephesians 6, you'll be aware that that's the, the time when Paul says, put on all the armor of God. And he goes through everything, you know, the helmet and the breastplate and the belt and the shoes and the sword and the shield. When you're fully clothed, he says, stand. Verse 18 of chapter 6 of Ephesians says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me. And later he says, pray that my witness may be effective. Four times in just a couple of verses, he says, pray, 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 pray. And he says to us, pray, 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 pray. You might have noticed there's an emphasis on prayer in Nehemiah. Chapter 1, <coughs> Nehemiah hears about the walls being broken down. And he prays and mourns. Chapter 2 
He's before the king giving him his morning cup of tea. And the king says, why are you looking so miserable? And what can I do for you? What can I do for you? This is the emperor of this huge empire. And Nehemiah prays quickly an arrow prayer. What should I ask him for? And then in this chapter, we have these two times when he prays. He prays because it's really important. It's not an option for building the wall, and it's not an option for building the kingdom. It's imperative. It's absolutely crucial. It's not Nick and Grace's thing. It's what Christians are called to do. And River Life, we have a prayer meeting on Tuesday on Zoom normally, uh, sometimes in our house. Do you know, when I look round, there's normally two guys there. That's Bob and me. The rest of the prayer meeting is ladies. Okay? Which, there's nothing wrong with that. That's wonderful for the ladies. Good for you. Where are the men? Is it only the ladies that believe in prayer? Or are the men too busy? We can't even say the women aren't working because they are working just as much as the men. I just leave it with you. Martin Luther said, work, work from morning until late at night. In fact, I have so much to do. I shall have to spend the first three hours in prayer. George Herbert, who is an English poet, said, prayer should be the key of the day and the lock of the night. That's nice, isn't it? I think Nehemiah would agree with that because he realized that if they're going to build this wall, they've got to pray first thing, they've got to pray last thing, they've got to pray It's a really important thing. And so he prays. This time, they don't work so much. It says he set a guard. And uh, verse 9b says they posted a guard day and night to meet the threat. And we need to be on our alert to the uh, threat of the enemy. That's wave number two. Wave number three is an internal attack in verses 10 to 15. There's three things that we see here. First of all, Verse 10, it says, there's so much rubble, we cannot rebuild the wall. It's like weariness. How can we do it? There's just too much to do. Verse 11, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put them to, a, to uh, put an end to their work. It's fear. So we've got weariness, we've got fear. And verse 12, it says, the Jews who lived near them came and told them 10 times over. Wherever you turn, they will attack us. And so there's negative speech. And those three things are really powerful things. How does Nehemiah deal with them? First of all, in verse 13, it says, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. In other words, where are they weakest? Right, let's strengthen the weak place. What about us? Maybe you know your weakest place. You need to strengthen that to make provision so that you don't get tempted in that way next time, but that you've made a provision to be strong in that area. You know, maybe the ruins of the past stop you building. They stopped the people building. There were so many ruins about, so many. They needed to be cleared before they could properly build. Maybe your life, you know, you've been trying to build faithfully, but the ruins have never quite got sorted out. Maybe there's areas that you've never quite repented of. Maybe you've never quite um, renounced some areas that you need to renounce. Maybe there's some release, some freedom, some deliverance that you need to be prayed for so that you get rid of all that rubbish and you can start building. We're in a marathon, not a sprint, okay? So we have to pace ourselves. And I think that's particularly relevant for a church like this where we depend on each other to do stuff, you know, around the place. We need to not uh, over-exhaust ourselves, but also to take our part so others don't exhaust themselves. So guard the weakest places. And then Nehemiah encourages them to focus on the Lord. And he says in verse 14, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. We were singing about the great and awesome God just a little while ago. Worship is such a help 
and such an encouragement as we take our eyes off ourselves and our problems and turn them back to the great and awesome God. And we need to be constantly turning to the Lord in worship. And then finally, unity. Because uh, he says that they will fight. He says, encourages them to fight for their families, your sons and daughters, your wives and your homes. And you know, negative speech pulls us down. Being negative, oh, we can't possibly do this. We have to, maybe we feel that, maybe we can bring that quietly to the Lord and confess our unbelief to him. But we need to be careful of negative speech and uh, maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Um, And then the fourth wave is learning to live, at the end of this section, chapter 4, is learning to live with constant the constant threat of war. You know, they're, they're, they have to just put up with it. They're going to be under threat all the time. And so we find half-worked and half-carried weapons. Verse 16. Verse 17. Some did the work with one hand and carried a weapon in the other hand. And verse 23. Night and day. We stayed in our clothes, ready to fight. Learning to live with the constant threat of attack. An attack could come at any time for them building that wall. It could come any place because there was a big wall. So he says, you know, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, come. We need to be listening. We need to have good communication so that we can oppose any attacks. And then he says in verse 20, as Carson referred to, our God will fight for us. Keep this confidence before us so we need to be walking with him. We need to be walking with him so that God, we're confident that God will fight for us. And let me just read to you um, from John Stott on his commentary on the Acts of the Apostles. He says this, As soon as the Spirit came upon the church, Satan launched a ferocious counterattack. Pentecost was followed by persecution. His strategy was carefully developed. He attacked on three fronts. On his first and crudest tactic was physical violence. He tried to crush the church by persecution. His second and more cunning assault was moral corruption and compromise. Having failed to destroy the church from outside, he attempted through Ananias and Sapphira to insinuate evil into its interior life and so ruin the Christian fellowship. His third and subtlest play was distraction. He sought to deflect the apostles from their priority responsibilities of prayer and preaching by preoccupying them with social administration, which was not their calling. And so I think he sums up really well there uh, three ways in which the enemy wants to attack. And we're left with the need to be on our guard and to be alert because otherwise we will not notice when Satan is seeking to undermine us. I put up on this next slide, I think, just um, a number of times when Jesus or Paul tell us to be on our guard or be alert. Persecution. Be on your guard. You'll be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. Don't be surprised. It's going to come. Hypocrisy, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. We need to guard against being hypocrites. False teaching, be on your guard, he says to the elders of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. In our personal walk, 1 Peter 5 verse 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He wants to devour your Christian faith. We need to be alert. There's other things that you can see there, including the gospel, which he has given us to guard, and we need to guard that gospel. So we need to pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Nehemiah. Thank you for his faith, for his encouragement, for his leadership. 
Thank you for the way he prayed and shows us how we should pray when we're attacked. Help us to repay mockery and scorn with love and prayer. Help us to be alert, Lord, to the enemy's assault on our faith. Help us to walk with you and to stay close to your side. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.